our, the results of our experimental re, uh, results agree with that theory, then it strengthens the theory. And we design further tests to the theory. However, if our observations contradict the theory, it falsifies the theory, and then we abandon the theory. That's the way science is supposed to operate. Now that's science, that's real science. Now, Dr. P. Ducey, he, 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 he repeatedly equates evolution with science, or his position with science. Now, he's a scientist, he is not science. Science doesn't say anything. It is scientists that say things, you see. Scientists express their beliefs. Scientists do that, science doesn't do that. Well, what about origins? Now, he says that evolution is a scientific theory. That is flatly not true. No theory on origins can be a scientific theory. Neither creation nor evolution is a scientific theory. Now, why is that so? Did Dr. Piglucci, was he a witness to the origin of the universe? Did he witness the origin of life? No. No one has even witnessed, no human witnesses to the origin of a single living thing. Those events happened in the unobservable past. They're not repeatable in the present. We don't see apes changing into people. We don't see onions changing into roses. We don't see anything, any significant change whatsoever. The changes that we can observe today are changes within species. There are variations. Darwin's book was entitled The Origin of Species. Many evolutionists have said that one thing his book was not about was the origin of species because he didn't even discuss the origin of species. He, the, all he discussed the variations within species. You see, creation and evolution are theories about history. Theories about history cannot be scientific theories. Evolution and creation are based upon inferences not based upon what we can observe right now. I have never seen God create anything. I'm sure you haven't either. But we've never seen anything, no significant evolutionary change take place either. It's circ it's, you see, creation and evolution are based upon circumstantial evidence. Now, we have that circumstantial evidence available, certainly. We have the fossil record. We have the natural laws that are now operating. And of course, one or the other must be true. That's only two possibilities. Either we were created or we evolved. You see, the, er the, the errors that evolutionists make is this. They not only claim that we must use only natural laws and processes to explain the operation of the universe and the operation of living things, they insist that we must use those very same natural laws and processes to explain the origin of the universe the origin of man, the origin of all living things. Now, in doing so, they've stepped outside of the limits of empirical science. And that is not science. You see, they claim evolution is science, creation is religion, end of discussion. That is simply not true. We have this circumstantial evidence, you see. And, you, and either God is or God isn't. Now, if no, no God exists, which Dr. Pigliucci believes that God does not exist, then of course he has no choice. Anyone who believes that has no choice. You have to believe in evolution. But you see, there are these, this other possibility that God does exist. And if God exists, there is another choice. Listen to what Thomas Huxley had to say. Now, Thomas Huxley was in the time of Darwin, he was called Darwin's bulldog. And uh, he pushed evolution, he was out there campaigning for Darwin and evolution. This is quoted from the Life and Letters of Thomas Henry Huxley, published in 1903. We read, quote, this is what Huxley is saying now, creation in the ordinary sense of the word is perfectly conceivable. I find no difficulty in conceiving that at some former period this universe was not in existence and that it made its appearance in six days or instantaneously, if that's preferred, in consequence of the volition of some pre-existing being. Then, as now, the so-called a priori arguments against theism and given a deity against the possibility of creative acts appeared to me to, to be devoid of reasonable foundation." End of quote. 
Now you see, Dr. Piglucci doesn't take that attitude at all. He says it's unreasonable to even consider the possibility of creation. Well, if God doesn't exist, that settles it right there, doesn't it? But if God exists, you know, creation is not only reasonable and logical, it is inevitable. And we think, certainly, that all of us should consider both of these alternatives. Evolutionists, however, believe that students are they are too illiterate. They're too incompetent to be exposed to the scientific evidence on both sides of this question of origins. They believe students must be protected from error and must be properly indoctrinated in what they believed to be the truth. They believe evolution is a fact and must not be subject to challenge. You heard what Dr. Pugliusi said. Education is not democratic. We decide what must be taught, what should be taught. Who's we? The evolutionists. Because they control our educational establishment. And they control much more. The creation scientists, on the other hand, believe that our tax-supported public schools belong to all of us. And that indoctrination in evolution with exclusion of the scientific evidence that supports creation in a pluralistic democratic society, which we have, is a violation of academic and religious freedoms of both the students and the teachers. Now, let us understand exactly what we're talking about here tonight, the nature of this debate. First of all, evolution. Evolution is a materialistic, mechanistic, non-theistic explanation how everything came into existence. Now, I'm not saying that all evolutionists are atheists because that's not true. But the theory is atheistic. God is not necessary. God is not involved. They believe they can explain everything on the basis of natural processes, including the very beginning of the universe and everything involved. One of the biology books in use in the United States in our high schools, entitled Biology, Visualizing Life, published by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston, tells us you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. That must be encouraging to our students. And another book, simply entitled Biology, published by Prentice Hill, tells us evolution is random and undirected, without plan, or purpose. End of quote. So you see, evolution has no goal. Evolution can't look ahead and say, now we need this or we need that. Let's work this out. Develop wings so we can fly or this or that. No, it doesn't do that at all. It just happens by mistake, by genetic errors, by these mutations, which are totally random. They just happen. The genetic error, genetic mistakes. And just, just so happens, somehow, they created this, this universe and everything in it. Creation, on the other hand, says this is the universe and this living thing came into existence by th due to a theistic supernatural origin. And it did not take place by random chance processes, but was due to the deliberate planned acts of an intelligent creator. Now that is the general thesis, what we are debating here this evening. Now, Dr. Pigliucci has described and supports what is called the Neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. All the genetic changes which have contributed to changing a little microscopic organism into people and everything in between, this is a result of mutation. Good mutation. Now, the evolutionists will say, Dr. Pigliucci would say, almost all mutations are bad and are eliminated. But once in a while, very rarely now, a mutation may prove to be beneficial and it confers an advantage, a slight advantage upon the mutant. Now there's a competition for survival, a struggle for existence. Though the good mutant having this advantage will reproduce in larger numbers than the original. So it replaces it by killing off the original. It is said to have been naturally selected. Now, these mutations are errors, they're genetic errors. If that little microscopic organism, which supposedly evolved from non-life, if that thing had never made a genetic error, that's all that'd be on this earth today. 
But all these genetic errors somehow has done all of this. Now that is what is being taught in our schools, our colleges and universities as a fact. That's sort of a notion. Now, however, there are some evolutionists who don't agree with that. Uh, and may I have that first slide, please? We'll turn on the first slide. Soren Lovetrup is a well-known Swedish scientist. He's known throughout the world for his work in, in biology. He published a book in 1987 entitled Darwinism, the Refutation of a Myth. Now, Dar uh, Dr. Lovetrup rejects this idea of neo-Darwinism that Dr. Piglucci is defending so vigorously here tonight. He says it could not possibly be true. You, mutations in natural selection would never produce what we have in this, in this world today. Totally ineffective. He believed in sort of a, a great big jumps in evolution. Some has called it the hopeful monster mechanism. That a reptile laid an egg and a bird was hatched from the egg. Just like that we went from, bird, from a reptile to a bird. Must have been a tremendous shock to mom a reptile when that happened. I think she would have given up motherhood. But this is what they believe, because they say there are no transitional forms between these major types of organisms. Therefore, there never were any. This is what happened. Well, he published a book in 1987 entitled Darwinism, the Refutation of a Myth. Now, what he calls the Darwinian myth is what is being taught in our colleges and universities as a fact. And our, most of our schools. What does he say? Well, I'm going to call your attention to his concluding statement. And I think this is very, very significant. He says, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. Ladies and gentlemen, what this man describes as the Darwinian myth, the greatest deceit in the history of science, is what Dr. Piglucci is describing defending tonight and what is being taught in our college and universities and most of our school as a fact. Isn't that astounding if that is really true? And we creation scientists certainly believe that it is true. We go one step farther. We believe the very notion of evolution is the greatest deceit in the history of science. Now not that evolutionists are deliberately dishonest or dis deceitful. But they have been deceived or have deceived themselves into believing something that is absolutely, totally wrong. Now, Dr. Lovetrop is not the only evolutionist who's challenging the theory that is being taught so widely today. John Camel, in his chapter in the 1988 book, Entropy, Information, and Evolution, published by the MIT Press, says this concerning neo-Darwinism. Quote, every one of its underlying biological tenets has proven to be a misconception. The disparities between neo-Darwinism and reality are so overwhelming that current biologists are scrambling for a completely fresh conceptual framework for the evolutionary process." End of quote. He says every one of its underlying biological tenets has proven to be a misconception. And that would certainly destroy all this explanation that Dr. Piglucci has given here tonight, how evolution supposedly occurred. And then there's Lynn Margulis. Now, Lynn Margulis is well known throughout the evolutionary world. He's definitely an evolutionist. Her first husband was Carl Sagan. And she published a book with his son, Dorian Sagan, and in which they attacked this idea of evolution described by Dr. Piglucci here tonight. They say that this, the, the neo-Darwinists have appealed, they have produced fanciful abstractions have been invented by the neo-Darwinists. Fanciful abstractions have been invented by uh, neo-Darwinists to explain how evolution occurs. They say much more. And it is said that Lynn Margulis, she's a professor at the University of Massachusetts, that Lynn Margulis at one of her many public talks, asked molecular biologists in the audience to name a single unambiguous example of the formation of a new species by the accumulation of mutations. Her challenge goes unmet." Unquote. In other words, she's spoken to many university 
audiences, where the biologists are present, she challenged them, can you describe for me one proven example where a new species has arisen by accumulation of mutation? And nobody has ever been able to offer an example. Now, if Dr. Pigalushi thinks he knows of some, I certainly wish he would communicate with Dr. Magulis and let her know about this information so she could then be silenced on this point. Now, in spite of all this, this neo-Darwinian theory of evolution is taught as a fact, as I've said, in most of our colleges and universities and in most of our schools. The theory is a lousy theory in, in substance. That's what it amounts to. It's not this beautiful theory that we are told and it's a fact, you see. Now let us consider some of the crucially important evidence related to the subject of origins. Now first I want to consider the fossil record. What would we predict on the basis of evolutionary theory? Well, the evolutionists tell us that millions of species have evolved through hundreds of millions of years of time. Now, if that's true, and a little microscopic organism evolved into these complex invertebrates, some of which we'll see shortly, and then one of these invertebrates evolved into fishes, fishes evolved into amphibians, amphibians evolved into reptiles, reptiles evolved into birds, and reptiles evolved into mammals as well, and finally the lower mammals evolved all the way through the apes to man. Why, that would have produced billions times billions times billions of these intermediate forms. They would have lived and died during that tremendous amount of time. Now, we certainly should have many, many of these transitional forms in our museum. There are 250,000 different fossil species in our museums today. If evolution is true, thousands of those should be of intermediate form. Any one of us, you don't have to be trained in science to go in a museum and look at that thing. Yep, there's something halfway between a forelimb and a wing. It's on its way to becoming a bird. Or you could recognize something intermediate between, a, say, a worm and a fish, or a clam and a fish, something like that. We ought to see thousands and thousands of those things in our museums. Now, on the other hand, if creation is true, cats have always been cats and dogs have always been dogs. And you know today you can't cross a dog with a cat and get a dat. Have you ever seen a dat? I've never seen a dat. No, they are distinct and separate kinds. They cannot interbreed. And furthermore, we have other distinct kinds. Roses are roses and onions are onions and so forth. Apes are apes and people are people. They're separate and distinct. Now if creation is true and these things were separately created, then they should appear in the fossil record complete. We would not expect to find ancestors for these basically different kinds of creatures. We would not expect to find intermediate, suggesting one has evolved into the other. Tremendous difference, you see, between predictions based upon evolution and creation. Well, now let's look at the evidence. In this next slide, we see a reconstruction of those creatures whose fossils are found in Cambrian rocks. They include, for example, trilobites, sea urchins, sponges, jellyfish, the swimming crustacean, sea lilies, clams, snails, brachiopods, worms, and many other very complex invertebrates. Now, these things are found in so-called Cambrian rocks. We find Cambrian rocks all over the world to contain these types of fossils. That's identify them as Cambrian rocks. Most of these are still quite alive and well today. The trilobite is extinct as far as we know. But we have billions times billions of fossils of these creatures. They're very, very complex. For example, the trilobite, we see a fossil trilobite, greatly enlarged, of course. And then we see the eye of the trilobite has 600 lenses. Each lens is composed of inorganic crystalline calcium carbonate. So the lens are still there. Scientists were able to study the lens of the eyes of the trilobite. They were able to study the optics. And they were astounded to discover that the trilobite had perfect undistorted vision. He'd utilized several principles and laws of optic to construct a perfect lens. And underwater, you must have a double lens to avoid distortion. Every one of those lens is a double lens. Now, if the trilobites and these other creatures, sponges and jellyfish, clams and snails and all those things came into existence gradually and slowly 
by any sort of evolutionary mechanism, we must find their evolutionary ancestors. Now underneath the Cambrian rocks are pre-Cambrian rocks. Evolutionists believe they were laid down during hundreds of millions of years leading up to and preceding the Cambrian. Now if evolution is true, what must we find in those Cambrian rocks? We must find the fossilized ancestors to those complex invertebrates, the ancestors to the trilobites, to clams and snails and sponges and jellyfish. We ought to find billions times billions of them. It would be no problem at all finding these things. They should be covered. Our, our museums should have thousands and millions of them. What do we have? No one has ever been able to find the fossilized ancestor to a single one of those Cambrian animals. Absolutely no ancestors for sponges and jellyfish and worms and brachiopods and trilobites. Every one of them appear fully formed. I'll allow an evolutionist to testify to that. The evolutionist is Douglas Vituma. He wrote a book called Evolutionary Biology. I'm going to refer to the second edition. He's a, a strong anti-creationist. Let us let him let us let him tell us what he believes about the nature of this Cambrian. He says, it is considered likely that all the animal phyla became distinct before or during the Cambrian, for they all appear fully formed, without intermediates, connecting one phylum to another. Ladies and gentlemen, that settles the matter right there. You see, this man says that we have, what does he mean by a phylum? Well, Sponges and jellyfish are so different, they're put in separate phyla, a separate phyla. They're all these creatures so vastly different when another put in separate phyla. A phylum is a, the broadest, most inclusive taxon in taxonomy. All vertebrates, you and me and, and all amphibians and reptiles and birds are put in the phylum chordata. It's so inclusive. These things are so vastly different from one another, they're put in separate phyla. What does he say? they all appear, what? Fully formed. Without any intermediates connecting one phylum to another. No connecting forms between clams and snails or uh, between uh, any of these other creatures. Hey now, wait a minute. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution changing an in the little creature into these complex invertebrates and all that diversity and we don't have a trace of any evidence for that. Isn't that incredible? No, it's not incredible at all. You see, they didn't evolve. This evidence proves that fact. Now, evolution has been searching for these things ever since Darwin, everywhere they could search, and they've never been able to find those creatures. That settles the matter. These invertebrates did not have any ancestors. That means we didn't have any ancestors. Now, furthermore, evolution has tell us that one of these invertebrates evolved into the fishes. Fishes are like you and me, they're vertebrates. So supposedly an invertebrate, maybe a clam or a snail or a worm or something like that, evolved into a fish. Some believe it took a hundred million years. Now we have billions times billions of fossils of the invertebrates. We have many, many billions of fossil fishes of each basic kind. Now if evolution is true, we must find billions times billions of fossils of the transitional form between an invertebrate and a fish. All the intermediate stages during these millions of years. After all, as Dr. Piglucci says, the fittest reproduces in larger numbers than the preceding form. So all of the intermediate stages would be very, very large populations. Our museums should have tons of these things. What do they have? Not one. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed. No trace, absolutely no trace of any ancestors and absolutely no connecting forms between these various kinds of fishes. Ladies and gentlemen, that cannot be true if evolution is true. Now Dr. Pigliucci and the evolutionists, they want to talk all they want to about mammal-like reptiles or archaeopteryx or whatever. But that's questionable. They're all questionable and disputable. Even evolutionists say some of these things were not what they're supposed to be. Here the evidence is clear, unquestionable, indisputable. No one disputes these facts. 
I read the evolutionary literature very clearly, and that they know. You see, they believe in evolution not because of the evidence, but in spite of the evidence. But this evidence is overwhelming. This evidence shows that evolution has not taken place. This evidence destroys the theory of evolution. There's no use arguing about anything alleged transitional form. As a matter of fact, there are systematic gaps between all major kinds of plants and animals. Now, everybody's interested in human origins. Well, I'm going to take a, a few minutes to discuss this. I, I, I have a book entitled Evolution the Fossils Still Say No. I have a 100-page chapter on the origin of man. I discuss all of these various suggested intermediates. I'm going to talk about just one. I'm going to have to do it quickly or we'll run out of time. This creature is called Australopithecus. Australopithecus was first discovered in South Africa in 1924. These are some of the fossils discovered later in Africa. This is a skull discovered by Dr. Louis Leakey and his wife Mary in East Africa in 1959. We can see that this creature was very ape-like. It has a sagittal crest, a bony ridge on the top of the skull. It's typical of ape. It has no forehead, very flat skull, massive eyebrow ridges. The brain was about uh, one-third of the human. So it's very grossly ape-like. But Dr. Leakey and others claim that the teeth were somewhat more man-like than those found in apes. So it's on its way to becoming people. Now, later on, Dr. Donald Johansson found fossils of similar creatures in Ethiopia in about 1973. One of these was, he called these creatures Australopithecus afarensis. One of these creatures was of a female, about 40% complete. He named her Lucy. And although, as we will see, Lucy is essentially an ape from the neck up, he claimed that she walked upright in the human manner. Therefore, she was intermediate between ape and man, as were her fellow creatures. And overnight, jo Johansson became world famous, as did Lucy. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, leave, please meet Lucy. That's Lucy. Now, later on, they discovered enough material to reconstruct the skull of these creatures. This is the skull of Austral Australopithecus afarensis. What are you looking at? The skull of an ape. It had the jaws, the teeth, and the face of an ape. The brain was 30% of the human. And all of these Australopithecines have long curved fingers and long curved toes. What do you use long curved toes for? Walking around on the ground? I say you do not. You use long curved toes and long cur curved fingers for clinging to branches, swinging from tree to tree. The idea that these things walked upright, it just simply contradicted by the evidence. Now, but this, this is generally accepted. This is what we read in our textbooks, what we see on television, what we see in National Geographic. But there are some scientists who disagree totally, and these scientists are not creationists, they're evolutionists, and they've certainly done their homework. One of these scientists, Dr. Solly Zuckerman, for many years ahead of the Department of Anatomy at the University of Birmingham in England. He was first knighted and became Sir Solly Zuckerman. Later, is raised to the peerage by the British government and became Lord Zuckerman in recognition of his distinguished scientific career. Lord Zuckerman had a scientific team that rarely numbered less than four that studied fossils of these creatures for 15 years. And he, they were studying fossils of these creatures supposedly one to two million years younger than Lucy. That is more recent in time than Lucy. If anything, they should be more human-like. But after all this many years of research, Lord Zuckerman and his scientific team declared these creatures did not walk upright. They were not intermediate between ape and man at all. One of his former students, Dr. Charles Oxnard, professor and director of the graduate studies at the medical school at the University of Southern California for some years. Now he's at the, Western, the University of Western Australia. This scientist studied these fossils he studied their foot bones, their leg bones, the knee joint, the pelvis, using the very most sophisticated method of analysis known in anatomy. After these many years of research, careful research, this scientist declared these creatures were not intermediate between, between ape and man. They certainly did not walk upright in a human manner, and he said they were not human ancestors. Do you see that in the newspapers or National Geographic or in the textbook? No, you don't see that, do you? 
But this is a considered judgment of these scientists after many, many years of research. And others have concurred in many respects. Now, Lord Zuckerman said in this area of science, that is, search for man's fossil ancestry, he said he didn't believe there was any science in this field at all. Now, why would he say that? Well, let me give you a few examples. This is a picture I took in the San Diego Museum of Man about 20 years ago. It's of a creature, a model of a creature called Ramapithecus. Now, you, you visit this museum 20 years ago. When you look at, you're standing in front of this creature, what would you say? There's living proof of evolution. Well, now we know evolution is a fact. Why? Well, that creature's not an ape. He's not a man. He's intermediate and walking erect in a human manner. How could you ask for better proof of the theory of evolution? But you would not know at that time all they had of that creature was a few pieces of the jaw and a few teeth. That's all they had. Using that scanty evidence and their preconceived notion, that was their model of Ramapithecus. Well, since that time, they found additional material of this creature. They've been able to have a more accurate reconstruction of what he looked like. Now on the left, we see the skull of an orangutan, a modern ape. On the right, I'm sorry, I wish, can you move this slide, move that over just a little bit to the left? We see the, this is a reconstruction, modern day reconstruction of, of the Ramapithecus. Look at that, compare it to that. And the face, it is exactly the same. Now, these same scientists who told us 20 years ago that Ramapithecus was intermediate between ape and man said, no, we were mistaken. We were mis misled by our preconceived ideas. Now they're telling us that Ramapithecus was essentially the same as a modern orangutan. Not intermediate at all. You want to know what Ramapithecus really looked like? That's an orangutan. That's what he really looked like. You see a considerable difference between that real creature and the model. Now on this next slide, we see a picture of Piltdown Man. This is a picture I took from a 1937 issue of Life magazine. Fossils of this creature were discovered in, uh, near the village of Piltdown, England, in 1912, in some gravel there. Uh, the jawbone was quite ape-like, but the teeth appeared to be human-like. The skull was quite man-like, but they put all of it together in a single individual, incorporating these ape-like and human-like features. They named him Eanthropus, or Don Man, and he became known as Piltdown Man. And the consensus of the world's greatest authority, Piltdown Man, was our subhuman ancestor until the 1950s when he was shown to be a hoax, a fake. Someone had taken a jawbone of a modern ape and a human skull, treated them with chemicals to make them look old, altered the teeth to make them look human-like, planted the bones in the gravel and fooled the world's greatest authorities. And it is amazing how many ape-like features those experts could see in that human skull and how many human-like features those experts could see in that modern ape's jaw that were not there at all. You and I say, I will believe it when I see it. They saw it because they believed it. Now, 1922, one two, just one two, was found in western Nebraska. Created a great deal of excitement among evolutionists because they thought in that tooth they could see intermediate features, intermediate between ape and man. The fact is they couldn't decide whether it was an ape-like man or man-like ape. He became known as Nebraska Man. And in December 1922, the Illustrated London News published a picture of Nebraska Man based upon the descriptions of the scientists. There we see the earliest man tracked by a tooth, an astounding discovery of human remains in Pliocene strata. Sure enough, there's the man, there's his wife, there's the tools they were using based upon one tooth. Isn't science a fascinating subject? Well, a few years later, they discovered some additional remains of this creature. He turned out to be neither a man-like ape nor ape-like man. He turned out to be a pig. That's right, it was a pig's tooth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at that picture. Look what an evolutionist can get based upon his preconceived ideas, based upon a pig's tooth. Now, these were good scientists. They were careful scientists, but they were misled by what they believed. Dr. Pig Lucy said, they don't believe anything. Oh, yes, they believe. Oh, they do believe. They believe, I'm telling you, what they believe is just incredible. Well, now here we have some other examples. The Neanderthal man, Neanderthal people. 
fossils of this creature was found in Germany in about the time of Darwin. Other fossils were found throughout Europe and other places. In 1908, they found a nearly complete uh, fossil of an adult male. And uh, uh, he looked like he couldn't quite walk upright. He sort of shuffled along. And so the Neanderthal people was portrayed as these long arm, knuckle dragging, beetle browed, stoop shouldered, bow legged, subhuman. He called Homo neanderthalensis, not Homo sapiens like you and me. Well, later on, they discovered other fossils of these creatures who walk completely upright in the human manner. They finally realized that that fossil found in France was an arthritic old man. The only reason he didn't walk upright, he had a bad case of arthritis. When x-rays became available, they x-rayed the bones and teeth of these people, revealed that they suffered severely from rickets. Rickets is called by, caused by a, a deficiency of vitamin D. If you don't get enough vitamin D, you cannot absorb sufficient calcium from your food. So your bones become soft and deformed. We get plenty of vitamin D today. It's put in our cereal, milk, and so forth and so on. But these people did not get enough vitamin D. They had rickets, which caused the eyebrow ridges and sloping foreheads and things like that. It is now believed by almost all of the paleoanthropologists, Neanderthal people were fully human Homo sapiens. And this is a modern day version of Neanderthal man from the American Museum of Natural History. You see, Neanderthal people were not our subhuman ancestors, they were human. Nebraska man was not our subhuman ancestor, he was the pigs too. The uh, Piltdown man was not our subhuman ancestor, it's a combination of an ape jaw and a human skull. Ramapithecus was not our subhuman ancestor, he was a modern ape, same as a modern ape. And so it goes on and on and on. Lord Zuckerman said this. He said, if we exclude the possibility of divine creation, then it'd be obvious that man must have evolved from an ape-like creature. But if he did, there's absolutely no evidence for it in the fossil record. Well, I would agree with Lord Zuckerman. If man evolved from an ape-like creature, there's no evidence for it in the fossil record. Now I want to introduce a bit of humor to wake up everybody. Uh, made possible courtesy of evolutionists. Now, most evolutionists believe that man has evolved from some ape-like creature. But do you know there's some evolutionists that believe the reverse is true? They say we have characteristics that are more primitive than those found in apes. So it must be the other way around. Ape-like creatures evolved from human-like creatures. We wrote to one of these fellows, He's at the Director of Primate Research Center at Emory University, Emory University. We asked him, do you really believe this? He says, yes, I do. You know, this is such an astounding suggestion. I thought I'd better get a second opinion. So I went down to that marvelous zoo we have in San Diego, and I talked to a little orangutan, a little ape. And I said to him, little fellow, do you know that there are some evolutionists that tell us that you came from people? People that may have looked like me. What do you think about that? Let's see what he thought about that. Well, it was obviously it astounded him. His hair stood on end. His eyes popped out. He said, no way. No way did I ever come from anything that looked as funny as you do. Well, I agree. I don't believe apes came from people. And I don't believe people came from apes. It is true, some of my ancestors may have hung by the neck, but none of them ever hung by the tail. No, we were not created in the image of apes. We were created in the image of God. I would conclude this section by saying this. Evolution is the substance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. Now, let us leave the world of the past. Let us consider the evidence for design and purpose. Now, Dr. Pigliucci says this evidence for design is not real. It just appears to be that way, you know. Well, when we see it anywhere else, we assume and had a designer, don't we? You, you see an arrowhead? What do you believe? Did an arrowhead just come about by chance? No. It had purpose. It was designed for that purpose. Therefore, it was created by an intelligent creator. And there's many more examples. Darwin said that if we could describe only one example of an organ or structure whose origin could not be explained by his theory, that would falsify his theory. Well, there are thousands of such examples. I want to describe only one this evening. I could describe many. I'm going to have to step over to the uh, overhead for this. And we'll turn off the projector.
Now, here we see a jet engine. Now, no one would deny that this is a complex structure, very, very exceedingly complex, as a matter of fact. No one would deny that it has purpose. It serves as an engine to drive an aircraft, get it off the ground and thrust it through the air. So it has purpose, undoubtedly. No one de would deny that all of its components have purpose. The rotors and the stators and the bearing, the drive shaft, the transmission or differential, whatever, all of these parts shows the evidence of purpose and they were designed to fulfill that purpose. So no one would deny that this is the evidence of an intelligent agent, an intelligent creator. And we notice how it all has to work together. Integrated, the integration we see here. If just one part is missing, the entire mechanism fails. Everything has to be there or nothing works. Well, you say, that is something created by man indeed, but that doesn't relate to nature. Well, let's see. What do we see here? Well, I'll tell you what we're looking at. Turn that around. We're looking at a little bacterium, Escherichia coli, commonly called E. coli. This is a little microscopic organism, little bacterium. And it has these, uh, what we call a flagella, that can drive it forward or can rotate it and tumble and everything else. Those flagella serve a very important purpose in moving this organism. So it can go to the source of foods, it can escape some harmful ingredients and so forth and so on. Now, let's take a look at the mechanism of this flagella. And I'm going to show you only one of these. Now, this is the flagella. This little propeller, you might say, on these bacteria. Here we see the flagellum. And then here's what's called a hook. It's really a universal joint. And it can swing this flagellum around in various directions. And then we go down through the shaft here, and here we see the rotors, the stators, and there's a motive force here. Almost some of the very same things we saw in that jet engine. Now, this is an incredibly complex system. You cannot imagine the complexity of this just looking at this. Now, you say that we invented the wheel. That little bacterium had a wheel long before we came along, according to evolutionists. He had the wheel, rotors, stators, differentials, or universal joints, propellers and bushings and all of that. This is the only one of these flagella in that organism. Now, could it come about simply by chance? That's what Dr. Puglucci believes. Now, this is the motor system of this little organism. Now, I got, I'm not going to go over to take time to describe all these things that I never get through. But look at the incredible complexity of this motor system. It can rotate counterclockwise and clockwise, and it, it, it approaches various things, and, and there's various responses. There's a genetic cause, there's a physical chemical causes, mechanical causes, polymorphism, all of this sort of thing built into this little microscopic single cell bacterium. Now that's a motor system, but that's not all. Let's take a look at its sensory system. You see, it has to have a sensory system. When there, it has to know where there's food. It has a sensory system. If there's some sugar there, it can move in that direction. It can move in the direction where there's food. If you have this in a solution and you drop a little tiny drop of acid in there, which is harmful, it'll immediately move away. It senses that that is harmful and dangerous. So it has this very complicated sensory system. Do you know there's at least 100 different uh, 
proteins involved in all of this. A hundred different kinds of proteins. What do we see? Purpose, don't we? To move that bacterium where it needs to be and away from danger. We see the evidence for design. Each one of those functions are designed to accomplish its purpose. And we see integration. None of this works un unless everything works. Take out one of those molecules, protein, mo one, just one of the hundred, it, the whole system fails. Now that is incredibly complex. We see the evidence for purpose and design now. Would you believe that this just came about by a bunch of genetic mistakes? How could that happen? You see, you have one genetic mistake, and supposedly it's beneficial. But you can't, you, 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 you can't do anything at that stage. It doesn't do anything. It has no function. You don't have a flagellum. You don't have all this apparatus to drive that flagellum. You don't have the, the motor. It ha this has a motor, a proton motor. You know it's got to have a motor to do that. It's got to convert energy into this motor and cause those flagella to rotate. It's got a motor. And you see, if one thing is missing, it won't work. Now, Dr. Piglus, he rightly tells us that we don't know everything and we never will know everything. As you know, it's not what we don't know about this theory of evolution, it's what we do know. We do know what it says. It says that everything came about by these genetic mistakes, these mutations, random, no purpose, no design, no plan, no intelligence. And all this incredible complex machinery finally came into existence. No, it didn't happen. It could not happen. Because it all has to be there or nothing works. And it all couldn't get there. You see, a little bit at a time. And that was the very substance of Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. Now, is this, well, maybe this is exceptional. Well, let us see about that. Here's a statement from Scientific American. Now, I assure you, Scientific American is one of the most rabid anti creationist books there is. Well, uh, journal. In this journal, January 1995, on page 64, we read this statement. Every living organism represents a successful integration of many biomolecular machines that convert energy from light or raw chemical form into whatever the organism needs. What does it say? Every living organism organism from a bacterium to you and me has many biomolecular what machines to accomplish what we need for reproduction for life and so forth and so on it's it's pervasive throughout all of nature throughout the universe and throughout biology we see this evidence for design and purpose and to say that that's just apparent. It, it, it's really not true. It just looks that way. No, <laughs> it does look that way, doesn't it? Because it is that way. Well, I could describe many, many other examples. Irreducible complexity. That is, if you take away one little part, the whole fails. Nothing works until everything works. These facts just absolutely destroy the theory of evolution. Now, Dr. Piglucci has referred to the second law of thermodynamics as it's, it's no problem. Uh, it, we have an open system, got all that energy coming from the sun, no problem. Now, just a minute. What do evolutionists say? They say everything in this entire universe, billions of years ago, was concentrated into a cosmic egg. Nobody knows where the cosmic egg came from or how it got there. Someone said perhaps a cosmic chicken laid the cosmic egg. Well, I've never heard a better explanation for its origin than that yet. But there it was, and for some inexplicable reason, the thing exploded in this big bang. What came out of that big bang? Only two things. Hydrogen, the lightest element in the universe, and helium, the next lightest. And mostly hydrogen. That's all. Just, just molecules of these simple gases. And they raced out at an enormous speed. And that's all there was. You might as well say the universe was hydrogen gas. Then somehow, stars created themselves, and galaxies created themselves, and eventually our solar system created itself. Life evolved from non-life, 
and evolved in everything living today and that has ever lived. Now, if that's true, you and I can trace our ultimate origin back to what? Hydrogen gas. That's right. We went from hydrogen gas to people. Someone has said if that's true, then you could say that hydrogen is an odorless, tasteless, invisible gas, which if given enough time becomes people. Well, that must be true. If there's nothing but hydrogen gas, now there's people. Where did we come from? Hydrogen gas. You know, as a scientist, I, 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 I don't know how people can believe that. Isn't that incredible? Isn't it unbelievable what an unbeliever must believe in order to be an unbeliever? It's just unbelievable. But that's what they believe. Now, you see what they're saying? Out of the chaos and disorder of this Big Bang and the simplicity of hydrogen gas, this universe created itself by a process of self-transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, if science is science, if natural laws are natural laws, that is impossible. There's this second law of thermodynamics that tells us everything runs down, everything decays. Naturally, any system left to itself goes from order to, to disorder, from complex to simple. There are no exceptions. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip a quote by Isaac Asimov. What Isaac Asimov says this, everything wears out. Our clothing, our houses, our machines, our bodies. We just don't have to do anything. Just do nothing, and everything wears out all by itself. He says the entire universe is wearing out. Yes, that's true. Every star in this universe is burning up its fuel. Now, if there is no God, or if God would not intervene, this universe is going to die someday, you see. Because the day will come inevitably when every star in this universe has burned up all of its fuel. And then, I'm sorry, I don't care whether you've paid your utility bills or not, the lights are going to go out. And there's not going to be any more activity, there's not going to be any life anywhere in this universe. That is a certain natural destiny of the universe. I have confidence that God's not going to permit that to happen. But if there's no God, that's going to happen. You see, here's my question, here's my challenge to Dr. Pigliucci. Would you please explain how these this natural laws and natural processes that now govern the universe are causing its inevitable death and destruction? How could those very same natural laws and process, processes create the universe in the first place? Is it possible that the very same natural processes which are destroying the universe could have been responsible for its origin? What sort of tortured logic would one have to use to reach such an impossible conclusion? The second law applies without exception to an isolated system. The second law of thermodynamics says an isolated system will go in one direction and one direction only, and that's downward. It will inevitably be, go from order to disorder, from complex to simple. Never, ever will it become more highly organized, more complex. Never, never, never. And yet evolutionists believe the universe is an isolated system. Nobody did any work on it. Nothing came in from the outside. It started in this chaos and disorder and a simplicity of hydrogen gas and transformed itself in the universe we have today, which is incredibly complex. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not possible. If natural laws are natural laws and science is natural laws, that could not have happened. The universe could not have created itself. Neither could life create itself. Molecules floating around in the water. If there were ever such things, do you think they could get together and make complex molecules, which then get together and make complex systems and then make a living cell? Absolutely not. Things just don't naturally go that way. They disperse, they break down, they're destroyed. The only reason life is possible on this earth is to have a layer of ozone around the earth, which absorbs that deadly destructive light from the sun, allowing the visible light to penetrate. The fact that we have green plants on this earth that can absorb that visible light and convert it into useful forms, into chemical energy, and they can create things, and we eat the plants. That's the only reason life is possible. But there could have been no ozone on the earth if evolution is true. No oxygen is tolerable. It would oxidize everything, destroy everything. So the evolution say there, were no, well, there was no oxygen. No oxygen, no ozone, because ozone is oxygen. That deadly destructive ultraviolet light would come right down this earth and destroy everything. You want to destroy DNA, you want to destroy proteins, you want to destroy amino acids, irradiate them with ultraviolet light. 
or zap them with electrical discharges. One fellow used lightning, simulated lightning, to try to create life. What happens to you when you get hit by lightning? Do you become more organized and more complex? I said, say not. You get obliterated, don't you? And that they say life could have ex come into existence by being zapped by lightning. It's ridiculous. This second law of thermodynamics destroys the theory of evolution, ladies and gentlemen. People, they can argue all they want to about open and closed systems. They start with an isolated system and they violate the second law of thermodynamics all the way. Now, we have one more line of evidence that's related to the origin of life. If I have time to do that, how much time do I have? Just two minutes? Well, I'm not going to be able to do that. Let me just say this, ladies and gentlemen, about the origin of life. Sir Fred Hall, a very famous astronomer, some years ago, working with another well-known astronomer and mathematician, Wick Ramasinghe in England, these two scientists wanted to work, uh, work on the problem of the origin of life. So they started out by making assumptions about the minimum requirement to get life started. They assumed every star in this entire universe had a planet like the Earth. They assumed the universe was 20 billion years old. Then they calculated the probability of life evolving anywhere in the universe in that 20 billion years. They couldn't believe their results. According to their calculations, the probability was essentially nil. Sir Fred said the probability of evolutionary origin of life anywhere in the universe is equal to the probability that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard would assemble a Boeing 747. Well, they rightly concluded that evolutionary origin of life was impossible. Therefore, it had to be created. Therefore, there must be a God. And they were atheists when they began those studies. Finally, let me say this. The significance of the subject of origin is extremely important. If God is our creator, he's the Lord and master of all that he has created. There must be some relationship between the created and the creator. And God controls our destiny. You see, it's very, very important that we understand the true nature of origins. And I believe absolutely, aside from what the Bible has to say on this subject, and I certainly accept what the Bible has to say about our origins, setting that aside, we can know on the basis of the scientific evidence that God or a creator must exist, some supernatural agent was responsible for our origins. So I maintain the best scientific statement we can make about our origin is still, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thank you very much. Are you enjoying the creation evolution debate? It's great to see you all enjoying this debate for truth. We want you to know that uh, this debate has been pre-narrated